In this section, we'll be looking at atrial fibrillation. Now, atrial fibrillation is a rapid, chaotic, unorganized rhythm. And what probably stands out to you just looking at this right now is there's this underlying, that isoelectric line now is all irregular. It's like someone has taken a pen and just squiggled lines all the way across. That is a characteristic feature of atrial fibrillation. We call that either a fine fibrillatory waves or a coarse fibrillatory waves. And really fine just means they're really small and coarse means they're a little bit larger. The other thing that should stand out to you is that the rhythm is irregular. Now, if we were able to count the rhythm, sorry, if we were able to count the rate of these, the atria and the ventricles, we would notice that the atria is actually beating now hold on, you're not going to believe this. The atrial tissue is beating at 400 to 600 beats per minute. I know, it's startling, right? But thank goodness our atrial ventricular node, it acts, it acts as a filter and it does not let 400 to 600 beats through because that would be just disastrous. So instead, we don't have the same matchup in rate. Now we're not gonna be able to count the rate of the atrial tissue here, but we can count the number of beats that are getting through the AV node and actually causing contraction in the ventricles. Let's take a look at a little bit more of this. Within atrial fibrillation, if we compare that to normal sinus, I always like to compare to baseline. Normal sinus, we've talked many times about the electrical conduction pathway. The SA node is the pacemaker, it sets the tone. It sets the rate, it sets the rhythm, and it communicates that information downstream through the internodal pathway to the AV node to the ventricles. And that's what gives us our characteristic waveforms and intervals. With atrial fibrillation, what we have is actually an irritation of the tissue between the SA node and the AV node. And there's multiple sites of irritation with atrial fibrillation as opposed to a premature atrial contraction where there was only one site of irritation. As you can see in this picture, it looks like there's fireworks going off in that atrial tissue, and it kind of is. That's why we have 400 to 600 beats per minute. We discussed that there's three things that can cause the atrial tissue to be irritated, and one of those was enhanced automaticity. These cells have this feature right now where they are able to generate their own signal and override the SA node. Characteristic features, irregular rhythm, fine or coarse fibrillatory waves, that's the P waves. Atrial rate is greater than ventricular rate. Now you were probably asking me or thinking earlier when we went through the normal sinus rhythm, why do we have to count the atrial and ventricular rates as separate entities? This is starting to show you why. There will be rhythms that have characteristic patterns where they do not match up. Now clinically, there is a risk for the patient to lose atrial kick. Atrial kick is what happens when the atria contract and then the AV node holds on just for a wee bit so the atria can oof, give that last bit of squeeze and empty its contents into the ventricles. When we lose that ability for that last bit of squeeze, our ventricles are not filling up to their capacity which means they're not able to export as much blood as they could. And we know that the volume of blood in the ventricle is considered to be our stroke volume. That is the amount of blood that is pumped out with every contraction. Now, if stroke volume decreases, it impacts cardiac output. So there is a potential for our patients to be symptomatic with atrial fibrillation. And then of course, the heart rate needs to increase to compensate. So there are two, two um, patterns of atrial fibrillation. One is controlled and the other is uncontrolled. If it is controlled, the heart rate remains below 100 beats per minute. Now what I've seen in clinical practice is that people will look at the screen and it will jump all around, maybe go 78, 82, 76, 94, and they'll just go, well, let's just pick 82. We'll just pick a random number there. It is better to put in the parameters. So if it goes down as low as 74 and as high as 96, write down that the pulse rate is between 74 and 96. That is what you'd expect to see with an AFibber. Uncontrolled is greater than 100. 
So if we cannot keep the heart rate below 100, that ventricular contraction, we consider that to be uncontrolled. Now, some of the common causes are aging. Oh my gosh. I mean, I never thought of it, right? As our body ages, so too do our cardiomyocytes and that can lead to AFib. A lot of times we don't have a cause. That's what we say, or that's what we mean when we say no known etiology. But there are some things in the history that can give us clues as to why a patient might be in atrial fibrillation. Their health history is an important piece to look at. So sometimes we wonder, is this just a normal variation of what's going on with the patient? Or is this actually as a result of something else? In terms of the heart tissue itself, so we've had anything that interferes with the lining, the endocardial tissue, the muscles, the myocardial tissues, or the external sac, that pericardial sac, those can all trigger irritation in the atrial tissue. Things such as high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, fibrotic tissue. Maybe we've got a valve disorder and there's stretching or there's um, thickening or it's becoming stiff the nodes are really close to that and so that might be irritating the tissues around it. Um, coronary artery disease will decrease blood flow and if we can't get the blood flow there there's decreased oxygen, there's decreased electrolytes, there's decreased glucose, all of those things that come with the blood. In terms of alcohol it can cause injury and inflammation to the cardiomyocytes. It can also influence the electrolytes and the movement across those membranes so our action potential Alcohol also can inhibit the vagus nerve. Vagal nerve, when it's excited, causes a lower heart rate. When it's inhibited, the accelerator nerve kicks in and we get a higher heart rate. It can interrupt the SA node function. It can change the structure to the atrial tissue and it can change the refractory period. So alcohol has a significant impact on the functioning of the electrical conduction system. Lab work, so we're looking at the thyroid panel. Hyperthyroidism will increase the heart rate. Um, it will also shorten that refractory period, the amount of rest the tissue needs so it can take signals faster. And if that's the case, re-entry is likely the primary mechanism in terms of the driving force behind the AFib. So now when we compare this to normal sinus rhythm, those features should stand out even more now. And I'm hoping, that this is really starting to be more comfortable for you, that you can look at a normal sinus rhythm and go, hey, those are my characteristic waveforms. I see that isoelectric line. I see my P, my QRS, and my T, and they all look normal. In comparison, atrial fib does not look normal. And when we look at potential differentials, we always need to have a few. We wonder, could this be artifact? Is this just the patient shivering in bed when I took their ECG? Is this atrial flutter, Wolf Parkinson White? I need to look and see what's going on. So of course we need to look at our parameters. And in this case, you're gonna see the only normal thing will be the QRS. The rate of the atrial tissue, we cannot measure, but we can get the ventricular rate. The rhythm is irregular. The P wave has that characteristic scribble look. So we call these the fibrillatory waves. QRS is narrow, it's normal. The T wave, we can't see it. And our intervals, we cannot measure. These are our classic features of the AFib. Now the primary goal of treatment in all arrhythmias is to maintain a ventricular firing rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute so we have good cardiac output. If the patient is stable, we're gonna be giving either a calcium channel blocker, a beta blocker, we're gonna do something to control the rate so it stays less than 100 because we want to have controlled AFib. In addition, they'll be receiving anticoagulants to prevent the clotting of blood in the atrial tissue. Now, when they become unstable, signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output, they're still getting anticoagulants, we still wanna restore cardiac output, but here's where we might be giving electricity to help them in the form of cardioversion. If the onset of symptoms is less than 48 hours, we can provide cardioversion. If it's greater than 48 hours, we're not going to use cardioversion because the risk of clotting is already there. So here's the question. 
How do we know when the onset is? Well, we go with the last known or the last reported normal day for them. So say they go to sleep, they go to sleep tonight and they wake up tomorrow and they feel really funny in their chest. They feel lightheaded. They just not quite feeling themselves and they come in. It's less than 48 hours. And we would consider that the time in which they went to bed as the last known normal and that would be the onset of symptoms. If it's been a week and a half and they're finally just coming in because it's not resolving, past 48 hours, we're not going to cardiovert. Now, if you are going to cardiovert, a little bit of sedation goes a long way because it's not very um, pleasant. In the next section, we'll be looking at atrial flutter.